this uh, expression has uh, different meanings. And if you look carefully at the gastrointestinal landscape, you may appreciate that uh, and realize that uh, it's really a great challenge for functional imaging to use ultrasound because, you know, there are peristaltic movements, there are a lot of gas inside. But I would like to show you through this lecture that ultrasound can really uh, provide valuable information also in this uh, part of the uh, abdominal organs. So you may appreciate the stomach here going down into the small intestine and the colon, and I will give you an overview of how you can image these parts of the abdomen. I think you all uh, realize that modern imaging is really moving fast. We are going from structure to function in imaging, we are going from anatomy to physiology, we are going from flow to perfusion, and from qualitative to quantitative imaging. So functional ultrasound is actually about to utilize the high temporal and spatial resolution of ultrasound to obtain dynamic information about organ function. And I would like to show you some example of that. And what you see here is a contracting gastric antrum emptying through the pylorus to the duodenum. So my agenda today is, is to furthermore talk about dynamic imaging of the GI tract to look at some uh, kinds of functional disorders and finally to end up uh, with the contrast enhanced perfusion. It's also a part of functional imaging. We're starting in the upper GI tract and uh, this uh, um, video shows the difference between a contracting antrum here and a contracting jejunal loop here. They have different ways of contracting. While the jejunum normally contracts with 12 contractions per minute, the antrum in a fed state is only three contractions per minute. And you can realize the difference here on this image. And the beautiful thing about ultrasound is what you see is what you get. Seeing is believing. One other example, in this case you see the stomach uh, volume here with a uh, solid meal lying here and a liquid meal on top. And you can, on this uh, video, also actually appreciate how the uh, solid meal is decanted and moved towards the distal part of the stomach. And you can also observe the small intestine below. So you can use ultrasound to study how the meal is uh, dealt, dealt with in the stomach. Uh, flow in the anterodunal segment has been studied in detail by one of my colleagues, Professor Housken, who will talk to you afterwards. And um, using ultrasound and a liquid meal, which uh, is a kind of contrast agent, you can see how the meal goes through the pyloric region and into the descending part of the duodenum here. And we have also used Doppler techniques and 3D ultrasound also to visualize how the pyloric emptying actually performs. Uh, this is a very high detail imaging. This is actually the uh, pancreas here. You can appreciate how the uh, posterior part of the pancreas <coughs> is uh, darker than the um, anterior part of the pancreas. And this is the liver and this is the caval vein with a valve. And uh, this is a contracting distal part of the duodenum. So using high-frequency ultrasound, you can really obtain a great degree of details. Another example further down in the intestines, this is the jejunum with a Doppler signal from the wall. You can appreciate how the valvula conniventes surrounds the lumen of the uh, jejunum. And this is obtained with a 14 megahertz linear scanning, really detailed imaging that is not possible to obtain with any other imaging modality. So coming back to your question from the last uh, speaker, this kind of imaging, MRI or CT, is not possible to obtain. Hypermotility. 
this is one example of how the uh, intestines contracts too actively. And typically, this is seen in a long-standing non-treated celiac patient. And the Germans have this uh, saying, the wash machine and phenomenon. It's, look, it's like looking into a, uh, a really fast-running washing machine. One other example, we are now moving further down into the small intestine. This is the valvula bohini. You can here see the uh, distal part of the ilum coming down into the cecum part here of the colon. And using Doppler, you can even appreciate how the flow goes to and fro over this valve. And only by using ultrasound, you are able to see this with such a great temporal resolution. We are in the same part now. This is the Doppler of the iliac uh, vessels. And here is a portion of the uh, distal ileum. And you can see how it contracts. And by combining Doppler with high-frequency ultrasound, you can study at the same time flow in vessels, flow in the GI wall, and how the distal ileum contracts. And this is, of course, of high relevance in uh, patients with Crohn's disease, for instance. Microbubble dynamics. Well, actually, there are a lot of microbubbles within the GI wall, as many of you have observed. You don't always need to inject microbubbles. This is natural microbubbles in a jejunal part of uh, the colon, of uh, the abdomen, and you have just alongside a more still standing colonic part. And for instance, when you want to measure the GI wall, this air layer within the uh, intestines actually help you to delineate more precisely your measurements. This is uh, to show the difference between colonic activity and jejunal activity. These are two jejunal loops lying inter position between colon. And the colon moves more slowly than <coughs> the jejunal loops in a normal situation. video shows how you can use Doppler to visualize a Crohn's stenosis. You can both see flow within the wall, which is uh, very limited. And you can also use the Doppler to see actually how the liquid within the lumen is floating through this stenosis. So you can see a very limited, narrow lumen here. What about therapeutic applications? This video is um, on courtesy from Dr. Raya at Oakland University Hospital. He used the ultrasound to visualize therapeutic intervention. This is uh, small children with uh, invagination of the distal ileum. So you can see how the invaginate into the cecum and how he uses hydrotherapy to press it retrogradely and the problem is solved. So, next point on my agenda is more about functional disorders, which is another aspect of functional imaging with ultrasound. And this story started way back in the 70s and 80s, and one of the pioneers here was uh, Professor Bologna from Bologna, who started to do gastric emptying by using ultrasound. He used 2D ultrasound in uh, a structural way to estimate the volumes of the distal gastric antrum. And he was then able to measure the damping of a standard Italian meal like pizza or lasagne and could find that in dyspeptic patients the emptying was slower than compared to healthy controls. But what about uh, the proximal stomach? We all know that the distal stomach is fairly easy to image. You can often see it with transabdominal ultrasound. But the proximal stomach is a lot, uh, much greater challenge because that is hidden behind the um, costal margins and um, actually extending up into the thoracic cavity quite uh, much. But if we uh, look at an average Norwegian lady painted by Munch, you can position the probe in the epigastrium 
if you tilt it cranially and fill the fluid, you're actually able to image also the proximal part of the stomach, like this. This is the proximal volume, this is the liver, the pancreas is interposition between the left kidney and the stomach. And by doing this systematically, you are able to image and study also patients with diseases of the upper part of the stomach. And we have particularly studied one patient group with, a, with a functional dyspepsia. And these patients typically have epigastric pain or discomfort. They have early satiety, postprandial fullness, nausea and bloating. And we have wondered, is there a relationship between symptoms in these patients and dysfunction of the stomach? And using this ultrasound method, we were able to show that, yes, there is really and in impaired accommodation in these patients of the proximal stomach volume. Here shown in this graph the sagittal section where patients have much less size of the proximal stomach than healthy controls. And we have also applied 3D methods to evaluate this and um, by doing that you can in detail study the volumes of the distal stomach, of the proximal stomach, and the total gastric volume. And you can get a measure of intragastric distribution of the meal at each time point through the gastric emptying process. And this image illustrates a typical finding in patients with functional dyspepsia. They have a smaller upper volume indicating impaired accommodation and they have a distended distal part of the stomach typically seen in these patients with functional dyspepsia. And this uh, has also been confirmed by other groups. This is a group from the Netherlands using 3D ultrasound. And they found the same, <clears throat> that the, in the proximal stomach, the uh, dyspeptic patients had a smaller volume, whereas in the distal stomach, the finding was just opposite, indicating antral distension. So to summarize these findings in uh, patients with functional dyspepsia, you find the normal accommodation in the middle. This is a fairly relaxed upper part of the stomach and a normal antrum, whereas in functional dyspepsia we have impaired accommodation and distended antrum. And in reflux esophagitis, we have actually found just the opposite using 3D ultrasound. They have an enlarged proximal volume indicating and enabling flow and reflux from the stomach up into the esophagus, giving reflux symptoms. Based on these studies, we have gone from research to a clinical test that we call the meal accommodation test or the soup test, and we give our patient a standardized meal. We do ultrasound scanning, we measure the distal and proximal part of the stomach, and we do morphometric measurements we evaluate symptoms and also to a certain degree do some kind of psychological assessment. And this is a package and we use to evaluate our patient with dyspepsia. In the same manner as the cardiologists provoke by having the patient to, on a bike to provoke symptoms, we also provoke symptoms by giving the patients a meal and we test the stomach reaction to that meal. But sometimes we get a surprise. Not all these patients have a functional disorder. And in this case, this 50-year-old woman with dyspepsia and weight loss for a couple of years, she had done a lot of workup in the clinical situation, both with all kind of imaging, also exercise tests from the cardiologist. We were not able to find the reason for this dyspepsia. And then she was referred to a ultrasound meal accommodation test. And typically this is seen in a healthy, subject, but in this patient we found a markedly increase in thickness in the GI wall of the upper stomach and um, uh, the measurements showed very clearly that this patient, this case, had a much lower area of the proximal stomach compared to the healthy controls. And what could the diagnosis be? Well, there are different possibilities, but the marked thickening of the GI wall in this case, turned out to be a lenitis plastica. So, 
We can also look more in details on what happens within the GI wall, and the previous presenters show you exactly how you can delineate the different wall layers. And this is seen here with the transabdominal ultrasound 3D of the stomach wall. And what happens in these walls during a contraction? Let's move to another level of detail, strain imaging, which is also an important part of functional ultrasound. Through a contraction, what is really, how much uh, deformation is it in the GI wall? We can use ultrasound to study the elasticity of the GI wall, and we, there are studies showing that there is a uh, clearly correlation between stiffness of tissue and the degree of malignancy. But we can also use uh, this type of imaging to study dynamic activity, wall motion, contractility, and that's what we have done for the stomach. And strain and stress is uh, something you may have watched during a um, boxing match. Deformation and uh, in uh, the following a stressor. And we use the probe in the same way. We deform the tissue by pressing the probe. We can then image how the tissue react to this by the color coding. When we look at, at contracting tissue, we use a Doppler technique, a different technique, but still we get the deformation of the different wall layers here in a sagittal section of the stomach. We can uh, have the different five wall layers. We position an anatomical M mode through the wall, and we can get an M mode recording of what happens within the GI wall. This is a muscle layer, this is a submucosal layer, and this is the lumen. And we apply then a color Doppler technique in which uh, green means expansion of tissue and yellow means compression of tissue. And then we can analyze in what layers are the different contractile activity. And if we look at this part, the uh, muscle layer of the GI tract, we were actually able to show that there is a difference in the two wall layers uh, regarding the outer muscle layer. You know that this consists of an outer longitudinal muscle layer and an inner circular muscle layer. And the contractile activity is actually quite different in these two wall layers during a contraction. And uh, if we give the patient a, a drug that stimulates contractility like erythromycin, this is, uh, a, we are able to image this consequence. This is a normal activity, approximately 100% uh, elongation. And if we give erythromycin, the contraction and the strain in the GI wall is considerably increased, 400% compared to the normal situation. And in patients with functional dyspepsia, we have used this method to really study in detail. Are there a difference between the different groups? And some of you may be aware that there is a Rome um, diagnostic criteria for functional gastrointestinal disorders and in the latest review, Rome 3, they have uh, distinguished these patients in epigastric pain syndrome and postprandial distress syndrome. These are slightly different in their clinical presentation. Pain is dominating in this disorder whereas sati early satiation and postprandial fullness is dominating in this second disorder. And using this uh, technique with the uh, strain rate imaging, we were able to show that there are actually great differences in these two subgroups of functional dyspepsia. This is the stress group, and this is the uh, epigastric pain syndrome group. And during contractions in the three phases of interdigestive motility, we find a big difference in these two groups using this method indicating that there are different pathogenetic explanations for the symptoms. And it is interestingly, using endoscopic ultrasound, for instance, we are not always able to press with the transducer. But then we can use the aortic pulsatility, that is a kind of abdominal hammer always banging inside our body, and see how that influences the tissues we are studying. And this is just to show you how the aorta actually influences on the strain rate uh, curves. 
these all these spikes are how the aorta actually influences on the GI wall. And now I have a quiz for you. What is the diagnosis here? Or is this an example of art? I think it's quite nice. What is your suggestion? That is actually, yes, please. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, yeah, it nearly hit the top. But this is actually something we may encounter from time to time. This is an artifact, but it's quite nice, so I want to show it to you. It's a um, strain algorithm that is running far off track. Okay, back to the agenda. Contrast enhanced perfusion is really adding new values to uh, functional imaging. And uh, the, the main, uh, main drug we are using, as you all know, is Sonovir, which is a sulfur hexafluoride. And the exciting thing is that when you combine acoustic energy with these bubbles, something interesting is happening. And uh, these bubbles vibrate, but you can use the scanner and manipulate the MI in order to make these bubbles burst whenever you like. And as I think Lars Torelius really showed us yesterday, you can use the ultrasound like a musical instrument. By turning on the knobs, you can really fine-tune how these microbubbles behave. And this is due to harmonic imaging. You know, ordinary, you use fundamental imaging, you send out one frequency of sound waves and you receive and make imaging on the same fundamental frequency. However, in uh, CUS imaging, we apply the harmonic imaging. We usually play our instrument at the second harmonic in, uh, wave but also we can use actually uh, the subharmonic wave. But this is what we mostly use when we tune our instrument. And giving contrast agents, you have all experienced now that you can really see tumors that are different, difficult to see on a grayscale imaging. And these tumors we are able to characterize and detect on a much higher level than previously. But I would also like to point out that there are now uh, time intensity curves in these scanners that you should apply in order to quantify the responses to contrast agents. You can easily measure and quantify the difference within the tumor and outside the tumor and get a, a graphic display that can also help you to give uh, the different wash-in curves and wash-out curves. You can also have uh, applied uh, curves for a best fit for the uh, wash-in periods. And you can also compare to different other organs like the kidney here. And this, um, this tumor is uh, most likely an hepatic adenoma. But you can also actually do grayscale imaging of contrast agents. This is a case of um, a liver cirrhosis, slight cirrhosis, where some pathology was uh, suspected from a CT scan in this region, but they were not able to tell what it was. We did a detailed scanning with contrast agents, and I would want to show you the uh, B-mode contrast imaging after the ordinary contrast study was finished. You can see how the flow is running here with bubbles, and this part of uh, the portal vein is occluded, with the thrombus and you can see actually how the flow is running just beside the thrombus. Using this uh, time intensity curve there are several parameters you can calculate area under the curve, maximum intensity value, mean transit time, perfusion index, rise time, time to peak etc. and I think we will deal more with that in the later um, lectures. This is one of the very first uh, papers looking at the actual benefits of using these time intensity curves. Uh, it's a work by um, Thomas Albach and co-workers in Lancet from 1999, where they study, uh, study the uh, transient times in the liver and show that there was a difference between normal volunteers 
and particularly patients with cirrhosis, with have a, they have a uh, much more compressed uh, period of uh, this uh, portal vein, this um, artery to vein um, time period. So, leading to the next uh, subject, uh, what about uh, IBD and Crohn's disease? Can we use uh, ultrasound contrast agents to actually uh, say something of importance for these patients? This is a stenosis, and when you apply the Doppler, you have an indication of there must be some kind of inflammatory activity in this patient. This can be confirmed with CUS. This is the stenotic part of the, uh, of the small intestine, and you can see how the, the perfusion is actually visualized by using microbubbles. And the question is, is it possible to say something about fibrosis versus inflammation in these stenoses? And with um, this technique, you can in detail look at the perfusion in the different wall layers as visualized here. This is the submucosal here, the muscle layer here, and the whole wall is right there. And uh, one with a fibrotic stenosis and one with an inflammatory stenosis, we were able to see that there are really difference in perfusion between these patients. And hopefully, we are now studying that, that in more detail, but hopefully in some years' time we are able to say whether this is a clinical applicable method. So, in conclusion, use functional ultrasound. Use the great capacity, both in temporal and spatial resolution, in your scanning of your patients, and you will be surprised to see how much details you can obtain. And if you want to read more from our National Center, we have now released three books, also covering these advanced aspects of abnormal imaging. Thank you for your attention.